Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Lots to get through today. I, 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 I don't know quite how we're going to handle this one because I'm, I'm beginning to realise, not necessarily that I'm part of the problem, but that I really don't understand the full nature and indeed the full scope of the problem. Mini Driver taking aim at her former co star Matt Damon and uh, suggesting that men like him cannot understand what abuse is like. This is a fascinating development in the ongoing. Um, revelations regarding predatory behaviour, sexual assault undertaken by powerful men in Hollywood and of course as we discover every time we do a phone in, um, powerful men or, or, or men in general just about everywhere but not all men which was the point Matt Damon thought he was making he's ended up arguably with his foot wedged firmly in his gob. Um, also on the programme today see what I did there I stopped talking before the light, but a bum 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 as a sort of way of making it be all all kind of tension building. Oh my god. What's what else is on the show? I now because I've just done that self-referential look back in the rearview mirror, I've forgotten. So I won't be doing that again in a hurry. Uh, we will be doing the mini driver Matt Damon story. I'm very keen to talk about shops. People kind enough to listen to the programme on a regular basis will not need any explanation why I love shops. If I hadn't somehow managed to break into this business, I'd be working in a shop. It was this, the only other job I've ever done. Um, and Toys R Us, looking in all sorts of bother, suggests that the long-predicted, not disappearance, but profound reinvention of the British High Street is edging ever closer. We'll, we'll have one of our annual looks at what it may look like in the future. Also, coming up, I got a wonderful email. A lovely thing this was to find in my inbox. Um, dear James, <laughs> dear James, this is the round robin my wife has done this year. I spent all yesterday afternoon printing it and the photos that went with it. If you do read it out, there is a fair chance I could get into some trouble. Thank you, Rob. That's coming up later in the programme, if you have any. It's actually a bit of a humdinger as well, although I, I will take the liberty of changing everybody else's name. I'll just leave Rob's in there, I think, un, unadorned. Um, if you've got one of these dreadful, not dreadful, these charming banal missives that other people who you barely know or indeed don't know at all think that you're going to be desperately interested in the details of Uncle Bob's bunions and the, this year's tomato crop. We'll revisit that this week as well. But we're going to begin with a story all about how... My life, no, we're going to begin with a story all about Jeremy Corbyn and how he thinks he will probably be Prime Minister by the end of 2018. There are two ways into this. You've probably already spotted them. The first is the simplest. Do you? Do you think he'll probably be Prime Minister by the end of 2018? Mm. Think on. The second is whether or not you, in the event of there being a general election, which is, of course, the first presumption for that possibility of becoming Prime Minister, whether or not you would... Do you know, it's, it's all about the undecided, isn't it? We spend all our lives debating and discussing politics. This is why my New Year's resolution is to try, and I will almost certainly fail, but I thought I'd tell you, so it puts a little bit of pressure on me to try, at least, to somehow steer a course through the, 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 the increasingly absurd polarisation of politics, especially because old left-right distinctions, for my money, don't really hold anymore. They don't really apply anymore. You're looking more at generational and educational divides up and down the country with, with regard to Brexit, and you're going to be looking more and more at economic divides with regard to other aspects of politics. But the, the people who are most interesting are the people who don't have a side. They're neither United nor City. They're neither red nor blue. And in the context of Brexit, the polling recently, which Remainers have got very excited about, or some have, others, of course, are too long in the tooth and too wizened and ground down by the grimness of reality to get excited about anything anymore. But the crucial constituency of people who didn't really have a strong view last June, they now lean almost entirely towards Remain, but 90% of Remain voters and 90% of Leave voters are still stuck in the tracks that they were in when they cast their vote. So if you were to focus exclusively upon the 
undecided, as it were, or the uninterested or the unengaged last June, they're now piling in on the Remain side. This was that 51-41% that poll that was published at the weekend. That one of the most interesting elements of that was the was the movement of the undecideds. And it occurred to me as I was reading that that the same thing probably will apply to the next general election, except that I, the undecideds are probably the most interesting um, context of my political life, my life as an adult, a politically engaged adult, because, I mean, who's not undecided with regard to British politics at the moment? How, how entrenched and blinkered would you have to be not to be wondering whether there might possibly be another way? I have told you several times I've bored you rigid with my complaints about feeling politically homeless. I keep waiting. I envy Corbyn supporters and I envy, in a way, the kind of Ian Duncan Smith Owen Patterson school of Brexit. In, in the same way that I, I, I used to envy my dad's religious faith because it was such an enormous comfort to him. Um, even though, because he couldn't prove any of it was true, I, I, I aspire to those levels of faith, but in terms of Brexit, you look at somebody just insisting that the unicorns are still going to turn up tomorrow, and presumably they still mean it, even though all of the evidence now is piling up to make a nonsense of every argument they've ever made. This, this faith is almost enviable. Do you know what I mean? Is If you spend your life sort of perhaps thinking a lot about stuff and um, uh, worrying about stuff and, and, and believing that things can be better and wondering why things are getting worse and looking at some of the um, reverses that our society is undertaking at the moment with regard to the most basic precepts of civilization. If you, if you do that, as a lot of you do, as I do, then there's something profoundly enviable about believing. I wish I believed. I wish I believed in Jeremy Corbyn. I really do. Here we go, says Sam. James is doing his fortnightly Corbyn bash. I'll tune in again at 11. Sam, we will miss you. Not much, but we will. And it's not fortnightly, and it's not a bash. It's a simple question. Do you think he'll be Prime Minister by the end of next year? And if you are in that undecided category, the people I would love to talk to today are the people who are considering a vote for Labour, led by Jeremy Corbyn, much to your own surprise. So if I just described you, hit the numbers now and tell me why, OK? Why? Are you contemplating casting a vote that takes you by surprise? 0345 6060 Second element of this one, the line is fairly clear. I will probably be Prime Minister in the next 12 months. Looking at the political landscape and wondering about the circumstances in which that could happen, recognising immediately that it would demand another snap, if you will, general election caused perhaps by some form of collapse in the current Conservative government. How likely do you think it is? Do you think it, how would it happen? And do you think it will happen? 0345 So it's not reluctant Corbyn voters. I'm going to try not to say Corbynite or Corbynista. It's all part of my, my New Year's resolution not to... So if you just depict something as a faction, you're suggesting that there's a, um, a degree of extremism attached to it. We may even try to stop saying bre brex Brexists and Brextremists, but only if the other side go first and stop saying Ramona. So the, 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 the simple question, you are much to your own surprise... You're, you're catching on to Corbyn, OK? I'd really, really like to talk to you. 0345 6060 And on top of that, so that we don't exclude people who are, who are a little bit more entrenched, perhaps, in a, in a position that could never contemplate Corbyn, what do you think? What do you think um, the likelihood is of him becoming Prime Minister by the end of 2018? And I suppose now I have to tell you what I think, otherwise it's a little bit unfair of me to demand answers to these questions. I'm really sorry. I still can't see it. It's not bashing. It's not an attack. It's not me. I just can't see it. I see a man who was swearing blood. Do you remember how long ago was it that he refused to answer a question even about whether or not he wanted to be Prime Minister? Do you remember that? It was about was it just just earlier. The, have we got it? Perhaps as if by magic. There was it was only in about January of this year that he was refusing to answer a question about whether he wanted to be prime minister. I've been wrong on one level because I sat here for for some time after he became Labour leader and said to you that his failure to put pragmatism ahead of principle made him unelectable. That this was the general wisdom. The received wisdom was that the. Corbyn the backbencher, the serial rebel, uh, the serial rejecter of the Labour Party whip, would 
cling so tightly to his articles of faith regarding Trident or whatever it may have been that he would never make the compromises that power demands. And as I look at the Labour Party's Brexit position, then... I think he is completely putting pragmatism ahead of principle. I, I think he's a lever. So the very fact that he campaigned for Remain, albeit slightly sort of half-hearted fashion, means that he was prepared to park a principle. I guess it's perhaps not a very deeply held principle in the same way that some of his attitudes towards poverty and, and nuclear weapons are more profound, more deeply held. But the Labour Party's position on Brexit, as I understand it, and I don't know that you, you, you could come up with a a clearer analysis than this. It's not my own, it's just sort of cobbled together from various overviews, including Theo Usherwood, LBC's political editor. I think they're waiting. I think they're waiting until public opinion has, has swung so firmly one way or the other that their position becomes almost a no-brainer. So if this, if this current trend of polling continues and it, it, it hits 61-31 next time instead of the 51-41 it was this time. I do think Labour would campaign on a second referendum. I genuinely do. Or, or on a stop Brexit ticket. But they're not going to do that until, in a way, the ball is already halfway over the line. And that makes Corbyn now, if that's the accurate reading of the situation, that makes him the opposite of what I thought he was 18 months ago. Because I, I thought he was a politician who would blindly pursue a position, a political position, to the point of excluding all other thoughts and dissent, and he would set his stall out and refuse ever to step away from it. We've seen the opposite of that happen, and yet I still, I'm sorry, I still don't get it. I still see a politician who is gulling the British public into thinking that he's some sort of avuncular old uncle, whereas in fact he's, he's, he's quite a hard left... Um, interventionist. I, I, I just... I, I tell you what my problem is. How long have you got? My problem, very simply, is that I, I don't think he does what it says on the tin. I, I think that all of these noble aims and principles, there has to be a better way, there has to be a different way, um, are probably true, but they just don't translate into anything that could be described as workable. And and you can send me your costed manifestos and your quotes from an economist that quite likes the look of it. I don't hear it from him. I don't know whether or not an analogy with a captain of a ship would be fair, but I, I think he'd be going around hugging all the people with seasick instead of getting down to the business of sacking crew members who weren't up to sniff and making sure that everything on the bridge was tickety-boo. He'd be too busy checking the lifeboats had thermos flasks in them instead of actually, you know, getting down to the business of telling some passengers that if they don't pay their fare, they're going to be thrown overboard by tea time. I don't know. I mean, I'm not expressing myself quite as clearly as I like to, but that's possibly because my thoughts aren't quite as clear as I would like them to be. Jeremy Corbyn says, I will probably be Prime Minister in the next 12 months. Hit the numbers now and just tell me how that makes you feel as well, because that of course allows everybody to pile in, even people who are quite genuinely terrified at the prospect. 03456060973. Alright, the analogy about the captain having to throw people overboard if they haven't paid their wages, their bills, their fare, that was possibly stretching a bit, but... Would you salute Admiral Corbyn if he was on the bridge of HMS Brexit or HMS Britain? 90 minutes after 10 is the time. Barry is in Woolwich. Barry, you can kick us off. What's it going to be? Uh, hello there. Good morning. Um, I don't okay. understand the level of ridicule that's applied to Jeremy Corbyn. No. I, I mean, I've looked at the situation with Theresa May and what she's done since she's been Prime Minister, and I can see why you would ridicule her. Yes. Um, but people defend her. People defend her and call her resilient and call her strong. Apply names which don't really apply to her. Strong and stable. Strong and stable names that don't really. No, she's been a ridiculous, ridiculous um, uh, poster girl for that particular yeah. slogan. I, I, do, you know, do you know what? Maybe I need your help. Because I spend half of my life, professionally speaking, laying into the lens, the distorting lens of right wing media without ever acknowledging that it's possibly, it's may have, it may have quitted my view. Barry, maybe the reason why I can't buy into the Corbyn project is because there's so few rallying points for it. And if, if we were living in an even vaguely pluralistic, genuinely balanced media, if we had, like, maybe just, say, 30 to 40% of newspapers that acknowledged the absurdity of framing all of our politics for the benefit of rich people, maybe I'd see it differently. You clearly do. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I mean, if I heard Nadine Dorries the other day on the Marshall or somewhere... And she was saying that, or she was everywhere actually on that day, saying, no, this Marxist, this Marxist government, Marxist government, 
no one questioned as to are why you sure I, 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 I think she's what 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 we'd call a pantomime she's a pantomime yeah, she politician is. isn't it did you ever she see is, the thing she, she said was, about me no, I didn't. She went, on to, she, was, she, she went on Twitter to say something. I forget precisely what the language was. I couldn't repeat it on a family programme, which is always slightly unnerving for an elected representative to do in public. But she called me something like a, like a posh boy, a public school posh boy something. And um, guess what? Go on. I went to the same school as her own daughters. <laughs> And, 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 and they still and, and book these people. They still treat them as if they have credibility or, or something interesting or, or, or integrity or a political point to make. It's incredible. And that's the thing. That's the thing. No one questions her to say, well, why do you think that? No. Do you know, or provide some detail or break it down. I like facts. I like evidence. And I know you do. I, fact, I do, but I haven't got much for Corbyn. You sell him to me. Come on, Barry. G give me, give me, some, give me right, some love. OK, so in relation to the Labour manifesto, yeah. right, given, that we're, given that we're looking at Brexit, we can't really fight extremists. I know how you feel, and this is us, I feel the same, but we mm. can't fight these mad extremists, right? So fine, Brexit is likely to happen. If it were, the manifesto makes sense because we need to start building revenue. We need to start making money as a country. The way you do that is you bring back services in-house and you start providing them yourself and stop allowing that money to go offshore. That money then can pay for other services and keep us afloat. It, it but also with the corporation tax, you put it at a level that's slightly higher so that you can use that money to reinvest in your services. Now, all of this makes economic sense to me. It's just, it, it makes economic sense. sense to me. I, maybe I don't trust him to deliver it. I don't know why. Why would that be? Because you've been told not to. But I've been told, I've been told that Ed Miliband's father was an enemy of the, of the state, and I, 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 I thought that was disgusting. Corbyn hasn't yeah, come no in for... One... Corbyn has not come in for the same sort of kicking that Ed Miliband came in for, no, actually. I know, because, because that is because the media barons are afraid, and we know this. Really? He's already said, he's already stated... I mean, Nick Abbott explains it pretty much every week. Nick Abbott they, explains pretty much everything every week. He, he, yeah, I know, and he's brilliant at it. Yeah. But, but he's, he's explained that... Those media barons run by offshore billionaires, they don't want Jeremy Corbyn in place because he has already stated his determination. No, but that doesn't explain why they've gone after, why they went after, I suppose, if the prospect of him winning hoves closer into view, then, then the gloves will come off, as it were, and the, and the, knives, yeah. the knives will what be out for him. The Daily Mail has power. We've been explaining, you've been explaining for the past few months. Did you see the, the story about David power. Davis going for, going for dinner with the editor after coming out of the first day of yeah. EU negotiations early? I mean, that kind of stuff would have stopped traffic once. Now it just washes over us. It's hyper-normalisation, Barry. They are subverting democracy by taking, you know, taking the ear of the Prime Minister. They're pretty much like the, the, the groom of the stool. I was watching a documentary. The groom of the stool to Henry VIII is the person that's closest to their, closest to their ear. And they can influence them. The groom Room of the stool. Did you hear John Burko the in, the, in the House of Commons yesterday? He's superb. He, he was very strong. Have we got that? Have a listen to this, everybody. This is lovely stuff. In voting as you think fit on any political issue, you as members of Parliament are never mutineers. You are never traitors. You are never malcontents. You are never enemies of the people. You are dedicated, hard-working, committed public servants doing what you believe to be right for this country. If there are people who cannot understand that basic concept of principled conduct, perhaps they need help to ensure that in future they do. Fairly clearly directed at the Telegraph <coughs> and the Mail and, and, and a couple of other media outlets, not yet prepared to name them, but he actually employed the vocabulary of their headlines. So, yeah, yeah maybe, maybe there's a pushback. So he's got, Barry, he's got your vote in the bag, whatever happens. Yes, that's right. I mean, no, I got, you've had your fun. It's twenty-five past ten, mate. You're going. It's not the Barry show. Come on. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, oh, mate. Oh, you know, I like it. I like. To talk. Oh, yeah, well, yeah, you like to talk. I like to talk. Uh, unfortunately, only one of us can talk, and it's me. Have a great day. Daniel's in Peter, but Daniel, what would you like to say? Uh, hi, James. Hello, Daniel. Uh, apologies if I sound a bit nervous. This is my debut. I said, don't worry. We don't know what you sound like the rest of the time. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I was just going to say, uh, I was a reluctant. Labour slash Corbyn voter last time round. Really? Um, I, yeah, I voted Tory in 2015. I was of the opinion that we'd 
win, win the referendum, yeah. you know, vote to stay and everything would carry on tickety-boo and I'll probably still be conservative now. But I'd say since that point, it's uh, gone in a direction I don't like. I'm more of a Ken Clark conservative, I'd say, than what we've got at the minute. The um the, the fascinating thing about this, I hadn't occurred to me until you just said that, is that we don't know how much of the Labour vote is born of people who are holding their nose in the belief that he's the only he's he's the Obi Wan Kenobi for stop Brexit. You're our only hope, Obi Wan Kenobi. And and yet he hasn't done much. He hasn't done much to justify that hope. There was nothing in the manifesto to justify that hope, but there is a sense, isn't there, that, that he's holding fire on this and that he could jump the other way and that's what keeps people like you on board, am I right? Uh, kind of. I mean, I've just read uh, that All Out War book, you know, the Tim Ship one. Indeed, and yes. It, it, it doesn't paint a very, you know, not a bright picture of Jeremy Corbyn in that one. This is this is the account. He's got a new book out now. This is the account of the of the Brexit campaign. I, I reviewed it for the TLS and said the only thing on which everybody seems to agree, whether you're talking about the ludicrous, sort of racist liar wing of the Leave movement, or whether you're talking about the the the, the, the relatively sensible trade led. Um, uh, beliefs, they all, all, all full-on Remainers, they all agree that Jeremy Corbyn was a disaster during the Remain campaign. Yeah, so I mean, I'm not voting for him because I'm confused that he's going to stop Brexit or anything like that. I just think uh, the way the Tory party's going, I think he might be less worse. And also, I think he is... I think he does like the popularity he's got with the students, and they're mainly. But when you, if you stripped away the other, like the the other support, the support that is born of the idea that he could be the one, he could be the the last hope. I wonder how much would be left because there's a lot of criticism directed at him for not really having the Tories signed, sealed, and delivered by now. The mess mm. that is unfolding at, 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 at Downing Street is almost unbelievable. The the the, the reverse ferrets and the U turns and the quitting of territory that, that she previously claimed she was sticking to, the Brexit, brouhaha, ludicrous portrayals, all of that. I, I do think a stronger leader, and I'm not sure what I mean by stronger leader, but a, a stronger leader would be just making hay at the moment. I'd agree entirely. I think there's so many things you'd be picking holes in, which he isn't. And as I started saying, I think uh, I wouldn't have voted Corbyn if it wasn't for Brexit. Yeah, if, uh, we had, if we had an alternative method of voting, you know, rather than first past the post, he wouldn't have got my vote last time round. Just, just a just sense not. of making it count. Do you think if, if something yeah. emerged left field, if somehow this... this um, a movement to just recognise reality and either have a massive rethink or indeed a complete abandonment of Brexit, if they manage to find a leader, because we, we talked last week about why the Liberal Democrats aren't providing this sort of leadership, could you can you conceive of circumstances, given what you just said about first past the post, in which a new force could come to the fore? Uh, only in my dreams. I think it's too much... Uh, I think it's both Labour and Conservative. It's too beneficial to them to have it first past the mm. post, so I can't ever see them changing it. No, I, I suspect you're probably right, but I, I just wonder, there's a lot of chatter, a lot of <clears throat> talk in the... Um a, a, a chatterati, I suppose you'd call it, about whether or not if they could find some way of getting an SDP type phoenix to rise from the ashes of the two party system, it could gallop to the rescue in time to stop Brexit. I'm not so sure. 10.29 is the time. A couple of phone lines free. Um, Daniel, that was a sparkling debut. See if Daniel can do it, you can do it. Have we heard any female voices yet? I haven't seen the breakdown on this. The male-female breakdown on polling is increasingly interesting. Some of the gaps are getting bigger. How do females feel about Jeremy Corbyn? 0345 6060 is the number that you need. He believes he will probably be Prime Minister by the end of 2018. I want to know whether you do, if so, why, and how you feel about the prospect regardless of how plausible you consider it to be. Um, you can email james at lbc.co.uk and you can, of course, tweet me at Mr James OB. Um, I've also got a little clip I want to play you about a former national security advisor in America essentially describing the current president as a Russian asset. I would once, as you know, a couple of years ago, uh, suggested that this will give everybody pause, but I know now that it will probably shift no needles at all. Some people will sit there going, yeah, I'm cool with that, or no, that's absolute rubbish, fake news. And then everybody with a brain will sit there going, oh my God, what is America doing now? It's half past ten. Who wants to be Prime Minister? You do, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, come on, who, does anybody want to be Prime Minister? 
but it picked up a bit of the Shropshire there, actually, in his accent. It's a slight Midlands twang on the prime. Minister, I haven't heard that before in his voice. Um, that's uh, apropos nothing in particular, because it, it, it harks back to a time when there was a sl slightly more um, laissez-faire approach to prime ministerial ambition. Uh, we thought on this programme, God, it's a bit grand. I thought, and I happen to have a radio show, I thought that he was a holding tactic. Uh, the McDonald, John McDonald had a master plan. There doesn't seem to be much love for John McDonald in the room, judging by social media. There is rather more for Jeremy Corbyn. And I, I can't carry on until the next general election doing an hour every month or so just asking why. So what I'm asking today is slightly different. If you're swinging towards him and you're surprised to find yourself swinging towards him, talk the rest of us through why. 0345 6060973. -06 and if, if I, I, this might be a bit naff, but if you do listen a lot and you've heard my personal uh, addressings of this issue, this particular politician. What, what do you think's wrong with me then? If you're if you're on board, what's wrong with me? Why can't I see it? A lot of people say to me, your your your, your ideals are identical. You believe in the same things. You want the same things. It sounds like he's quoting you sometimes at PMQs. In fact, Theo Ushford's convinced that he is. But um, after having conversations with with members of his top team, he won't be interviewed by me. But that's. Uh, you know, I'm sure that's not entirely personal. There's lots of people he hasn't been interviewed by. What's my problem? If I, if I believe in a redistribution of wealth, I believe that we should probably renationalize some utilities or at least find a way of ensuring that all the money that's raised from providing us with essentials like energy and, and rail travel goes back into improving the quality of energy supply and rail travel rather than into the pockets of institutional investors. There's room for some investment and, and profit. Of course there is. It would be daft to suggest otherwise. Maybe that's where I diverge from him. Maybe he does suggest otherwise. But but I believe in that. I believe that poverty in this country is, is um, I think it's a crying shame and increasing. I think that there's a sense of precariousness in people's lives that is utterly unrecognised by most of Westminster. Some Westminster politicians pretend to care about precariousness when they were canvassing for, for Brexit by suggesting that the reason why your life is precarious is all because of immigrants. But they know they're lying when they say that, and they know that they're not going to improve the lives of the people whose votes they secured by getting them to damage their economic situation. The, the, these billionaire Brexit backers are in it entirely for themselves and the most cynical thing they did was trade on that sense of precariousness in, in, in old industrial communities in so-called working class areas of the country and, and claim not that the precariousness brought about by austerity and by a profound economic shift over the last 30 years from investment in workforce and research and development to rewarding of shareholders, that's what's brought people to their knees, that's what's diminished people's lifestyles, that's what's uh, reduced the amount of money that people have in their pockets, deliberate finance sector led redrawing of, of political landscapes. But of course, if you were benefiting from that redrawing of political landscapes, you would give your eye teeth for something to come along and provide you with a scapegoat. And that's what Brexit became. You go into these areas where people feel this isn't right. I should have more. This can't be fair. And tell them, well, look at him over there. He's got loads. Yeah, he's probably sending it all back to Poland as well. Yeah, that's why, that's why you can't uh, that's why you can't afford to go on holiday this year because of that fella over there. It's brilliant, absolutely brilliant. But um, Corbyn needs to keep those people on side, which is why I, I find the prospect of the next general election as chilling as I do fascinating. Oh three four five six oh six oh nine seven three. James, you're afraid to support Corbyn because of how his supporters are portrayed. That's definitely not the truth, mate. If I adopted any position because of fear of reaction, then. Um, well, I'd probably never open my mouth again. Tom's in Ealing. Tom, what do you think's going on? Well, I, I think it's very true when you, you say you share an awful lot of Jeremy Corbyn's views. Well, I would call them Christian, actually. I know he's not a man of, of, of faith, and, and I only try to be. But in terms of, you know, loving your neighbour, looking after those less fortunate than yourselves, doing unto others as you would have do, done unto yourself, I just call it Christian. Sure. Uh, yeah, you, you can give it whatever name yeah. you like. I think we, we try to give too much to what tag and background is from. True. If, you, if we truly want to redistribute well, try and help those less fortunate than us, I think we have to try something new. I'm, I'm nearly 40 in my lifetime. I don't believe there has been anything tried other than a real capitalist model that 
hasn't worked to close the gap between rich and poor in, in any way, shape or form. I think the Blair years weren't really true to the Labour ideology, but I suppose I'm giving things tags yes. now by saying that. But, you know... So, to, well, but, but what would change one of, then? One of how, how, greatest achievements was... was was Tony Blair, as she's quoted as saying. But, um, and, and you're right. But but what, what would be different? How would you... Because I, I, I know that this is where we run the... Are you all right, mate? The noises you're making are really getting down my lug holes. Sorry. That's all right. What have you done? Have you run up the stairs or something? Bit of a cold. Bit That's a cold. OK. Well, blow your nose before you phone LBC. There's a million people <laughs> hanging on your every sniffle. The, um, uh, I apologise. No, no, that's quite all right. That's a bit snappy of me, I suppose. I've just managed to avoid the cold so far this year. What would happen, then, in, in policy terms? Because you don't want to redraw... This is where people start going, Marxist. Um, that, that's just daft. But equally, when you say capitalism has failed, what are you going to replace it with? Because capitalism hasn't really failed. Capitalism is probably responsible for the greatest advances in the human condition since the species began. Well, I suppose I'm, I suppose there, again, I, we're giving it labels again. I would, I would like to replace a system of government, whether it's anti-capitalist or, or pro-capitalist or somewhere between the two, I would, I would like a system of government that truly talks about what things cost, what, what, how we raise that money to do it, and how we redistribute it to stop the gap game. But I'm, that's bigger. what I'm asking, mate. You can't say, because with respect, and it may just be because you're full of cold, you're sounding a bit Brexity. You're sounding like everything, everything has to be oh, different. Absolutely not. No, that's, that's a, oh, well, blimey, that's the last thing I want to. No, I don't, I don't mean like. you are Brexity. I mean no. that you're sounding a bit like a unicorn, um, believer. You're just sort of saying things can be different and under Corbyn they will be and I say how and you say mm, labels. Well, uh, okay, no, okay, I suppose okay, <laughs> the, the first thing we've got to do is be honest about taxation in this country. Right. We want we, we, we for years have wanted an American level of taxation but a European level of service. So there's many, many of us who can afford to pay a little bit more tax without it having any effect on our quality of life. There are many, many people and tax loopholes that people who earn and could should be paying an awful lot more tax should be filled but again you, you see i, I think i don't really care if as a party you say you want to put 10 billion pounds more into the nhs if the real amount that's needed is a trillion pounds we've got to have honest debate that's not led by right-wing press the, but the, you know what the problem is? is, is and, and doing this job has exposed me and, and I think in recent months perhaps softened and mellowed me to the effects that the media has upon people because even people who aren't in a position to pay a little bit more tax will come down on the side of people who are. Once it's been put through the mangle of the mail, you will have people yeah. saying 1% of the earners pay 23% of income tax or something like that. And that then gets changed into 1% of earners pay 23% of tax, which isn't yeah. true. The taxes that true. raise the most amount of money are the really iniquitous ones like VAT, which you pay if you're on minimum wage. The same percentage of, of, of a sales tax that, that, that Philip Green pays. And that seems wrong to me, but how do you get that message out there? I, do you, I wonder, actually, Tom, whether every single political conversation now in Britain, and this is why John Burko speaking in the House of Commons yesterday seemed like quite a significant moment for me, although obviously it's not been very widely reported in the newspapers that he was actually talking about. Sure. Every political conversation boils down to, how do you get rid of the propaganda, the, the distorting lens of right-wing journalism, represented uh, most by, by the Mail and Murdoch? Uh, uh, and, and to an extent, James, maybe, dare I say it, no offence meant, but maybe that's even influencing you for not being able to go that way. Yeah, maybe it is. Pro properly support Corbyn. Uh, you know, I don't think it is, but, uh, I, but I acknowledge the possibility. Uh, but of course, so many of your things do agree. Every, everything is, you know, redistribution, and and we're not talking about a massive Marxist idea. You can no longer earn money without giving it all to the state. He's not. He's not saying that. I don't think. No, but he has done. Bank. He has in the past done some pretty fruity things with regard to that kind of politics, and and that makes me. All politicians tread tread a line that sometimes <laughs> they've they've towed away from? No. Is there an element of that? No, it's a strong could... point, because what, what you should have done then, you should have come back and said, oh, OK, James, so you want a politician that never never veers from exactly. from an established party. You want a Jeremy Hunt, do you, rather than a Jeremy Corbyn? There you go. And actually, Jeremy Corbyn, to, to an awful lot of people, has stayed very true to his ideals. He hasn't, he hasn't played a career game to get himself elected or populist or... I'll or give you that. Like that. I'll but, give you that. You know? I know. So, uh, What's I, my problem? 
what, what is the but let's no but what is many people's problem it's, it's a question that has to be asked and it's maybe a question that the labor party should be asking themselves how do they address it because well, i think they're bypassing traditional media i've started doing some work with a website called joe and what, what i've realized since working there is that i am an i am a dinosaur i'm only 45 years old but in terms of where people get their news from this is why the political divides in this country are now much more generational than than traditionally political i think you yeah. could probably break it down to people who who, who are exposed to right-wing newspapers which makes them probably 45 plus and people who aren't which makes them 45 minus and there, there you will see on that very fulcrum on that very pivot i reckon you'd see a huge swing away from and towards corbyn based upon whether or not right-wing newspapers are part of their political landscape uh, you've just filled me with an amazing amount of christmas hope with that well i did i believe that children are the future tom well, <laughs> male and the son are no longer going to influence our political outcome. Uh, They're not for younger people, but it's just a question of how much more we have to put... Actually, before you go, what do you think the average age of a Fox News viewer is in America? I honestly couldn't answer that. I don't know. Uh, over, uh, over 70. Over 50? Over, over 70, 50. mate. Over 70. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, yeah, and there they're, you go. They're, I'll leave you with that. No, you don't have to respond. Let's, let's let, let the bombshell let the bombshell seep through. Ten forty six is the time. You're listening to James O'Brien on LBC. Gary Barker, who is a, a very good cartoonist, you can see his work in the New European and, and other places. Being in touch, say, I'm a Socratic capitalist. I don't really like the system, but until they come up with something better, it will get my support. But it must be properly regulated, and the problem in the UK is that it's not. The other problem, of course, is that we don't, don't learn enough history, because if we did, we'd know that regulation was deliberately removed in the 80s, um, and that is, uh, A, how the seeds were sown for the financial collapse of 2008, and B, why our social housing problem is so acute in this country. Uh, a slight simplification of things, but trust me. 10.49 is the time. Speaking of trust, there are a handful of journalists in this country who, if they contact me before 10 o'clock in the morning and tell me that they're working on something that my listeners will find interesting, I move heaven and earth. To, to find a berth for them on the programme. Jason Farrell from Sky News is one of those journalists, and he tickled my fancy this morning by referring to Anna Soubry's box of trolls, um, which is a slightly, probably inappropriate term, given that she's now in receipt of death threats. And, and when I coined the phrase box of trolls, it was done largely in jest. Things are altogether more serious now, Jason. What have you been up to? Well, Anna Soubry gave us about 35 pages of documents. I mean, we weren't the only ones. There's quite a few other uh, news outlets sure. have given them uh, a, a dossier, really, of emails, tweets that she'd received, and a large number of them suggesting that she should be hanged, um, along with her other uh, Brexit rebels. And uh, we thought it would be good to contact some of these people just to uh, see what they were thinking. So, for example, a woman in Warwickshire... Uh, I called up. She'd, asked, she'd said to Anna Soubry that she should live in fear for the rest of her life. That she, she hoped that would be the least of her worries. She should always be looking over her shoulder. How did you track them down, uh, Jason? Well, I'm not going to claim huge, uh, clever, intelligent journalism here. Some of these emails came with fairly clever indicators, such as oh, phone numbers. Oh, <laughs> oh, 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 OK. Well done, Sherlock. <laughs> I, I know, incredible, wasn't <laughs> well it? Well done, Scoop. I thought of it. What a scoop. Robert, um, I only ask, because I, I've spoken to you about this in the past, I've got a television production yeah. company that's desperate for me to go and knock on the doors of some of my trolls, but my trolls aren't um, quite as well, easy to it, find. It, as. It, yeah, so I, I contacted the ones that have sent emails. Yes. I don't know if some of those emails have a, you know, automatic phone number underneath, whatever. Sure. Anyway, some of them we did a little bit more research, but it was fairly easy. And uh, we called up a uh, woman in Warwickshire. I, we started not to identify them. Of course. And said, uh, you know, what, what, how do you really yes. feel like this? Um, and pretty um, often they would say, well, this particular woman said, well, yes. Um, but then she sort of said, well, you know, you're twisting what I said. She said it. She'd said it first. I was sort of repeating what she said. And I, I had to read it out and say, no, you say, mm. I hope you live in fear for the rest of your life. That's the least that you should, you know, yes. feel. So it was pretty unambiguous language. And eventually she hung up. Then I, I rang another man, a man in Kent, who um, had said that uh. she deserved to be hanged. And, I mean, unbelievably, he did sort of stick by what he said until I said, look, even if you believe in the death penalty, do you really genuinely think that a politician deserves to be hanged for something they said for expressing a view, for voting... Uh, a certain way, 
And he said, well, I definitely think we should have the death penalty. It's debatable. <laughs> Maybe I regret it. So that's the most I got from him. He wouldn't apologise. Good said. grief. So and this is... That, is... Was the, that was the attitude. Uh, and, and you sound surprised, and you'll understand I'm not. Uh, you're surprised to discover know, yeah. that, that this stupidity and nastiness is real. It's not just people desperate for attention. It's partly desperate plea for attention, but it, but it, but it does actually mask genuinely, uh, almost unbelievably low levels of, of, of compassion and, and intellect. Well, a couple of things about it. I mean, I mean, first of all, I mean, I thought when we looked at them, they were so similar, so identical, a lot of these emails mm. and tweets saying she should be hanged, that we considered that maybe there was some kind of, you know, techno bot out there sending these things out. So yes. part of the motivation for calling up was to think, well, are, these are they people? real people? Um, and then it's funny, we played it back to Anna Subri just after that debate you were playing earlier, the, the yes. bird clip. And she'd been in, and she came to us after that, and we played out what these people had said. And she said, in some ways, she was reassured by it because they were, she could tell, and you could tell from the conversations, that they were keyboard warriors. Yes. She described it. You know, they, they weren't the genuine, the people I'd spoken to weren't the genuine, they weren't going to come and lynch her. Those, they weren't those kind of people. She felt they had been motivated by the other thing you're talking about, by the media. By press, the, you know, that some of the things they said were repeating what they had read mm. in the newspapers, and of course she felt reassured by that. But when I said to her, you know, I mean, if I had that level of abuse in my inbox, I would be worried. Yeah, you know, I said you must be worried. She, she said, well, yeah, I am worried. And to the extent that, for example, she went to a carol service um, recently, and she didn't tell her constituents she was going there. And normally she would, but in the wake of this vote. She, and the abuse that she's had, she did not publicise, she did not pre-publicise where she was going in her constituency. And oh. I think that's the kind of worrying thing. You know, you, you you look at it and you go, well, hopefully these are people who are just saying this, they're venting their anger, they feel that these politicians don't represent them, they want, perhaps in some cases they want to intimidate them to vote another way. Yes. But, of course, that, that sort of heavy pal hangs over Westminster after the death of Joe Cox. And you never know if one of these people is serious. And, and that's, that's a genuine concern for MPs now, and that's something they have to live with. And that is a, a direct result of so-called reclaiming democracy. I, I presume, and I hesitate to ask you this because I didn't clear it with you in advance, I presume that there was a conversation at Sky News about identifying these people, which would have been informed slightly by the lady who took her own life after Martin Brunt um, unveiled her as one of the McCann trolls. Yeah, I mean, we always take these legal positions very seriously of and, and protecting people. Uh, and in this instance, we thought um, uh, we, okay. we had a genuine public interest in calling them because this is something that has come up in Parliament. And they'd contacted an MP un under their own name, had they, rather than calling themselves I mean, one of them, for Crusader example, two. C one of them CC'd in um, BBC Breakfast in okay. the email. So in that respect, you're looking at it going, well, they're actually inviting the media on this to, yes. to contact them. And, and, and then, yes, the decision was made not to, um, to to identify those people. So there's nothing that will actually identify them other than their voices, obviously, sure. in the piece. But, uh, yeah, it's, you, know, it's one of, you have to balance these things up. Of course you do. Fascinating stuff, great report. And, and uh, a few compliments coming in already, actually, so I shall refer them towards... Sky News. Here you go, Jason. Good to hear a reporter on um, at Mr. James O'Brien chasing those harassing and threatening Anna Subri and asking for explanations. This needs to happen much, much more often. So you can see Jason's report on Sky News throughout the day. And um, should we try and get a couple of those clips as well, if we can? Because I'd love to hear a, a, a clip or two. One of the Conservative MPs who defied Theresa May on a crucial Brexit vote has revealed the level of online abuse that she's received as a result. Anna Subri has submitted a 35-page dossier of threats of violence against her to the common speaker. The threats include calls for her to be hanged. Sky News has now confronted some of the people who sent those abusive messages. Our senior political correspondent Jason Farrell reports. There can never be a place for the threats of violence and intimidation against some members that we have seen in recent days. Yesterday, Parliament was forced to address the levels of abuse that have been measured out to MPs in the wake of last week's Brexit vote. Remain supporting MP Anna Subri has given Sky News 35 pages of insulting tweets and emails that she received after supporting an amendment to the Brexit withdrawal bill. 
Some of them say she deserved to be hanged. One said she should live life in fear. Sky News contacted the sender of that by phone. Your, some of your language is quite strong. I hope you live the rest of your life looking over your shoulder in fear. It's the least you deserve. That's quite threatening, isn't it? No, no. If you read it in context, that's what she said. Um, somebody had written and... But you're saying, I, you're saying I hope you, you... You're saying I, I hope you live yeah. in fear. Is that what you hope? Well, yeah. I don't see why not. What, she should live in fear looking over her shoulder? If she's... You're, you're twisting it. I'm not, I'm not, I'm just... Uh, want to continue with this conversation. I'm not twisting, I'm just, I'm just yeah, reading what yeah. you've written. Then we called another who wanted to see Anna Subri hanged. That's pretty threatening language, isn't it? I don't care what you think. I don't like them, they should be gone. It's not what I think. I mean, most people would think that's pretty disgraceful language. Well, I don't care what you think. Is condemning them in the same way that even if you thought capital punishment was good for murderers, surely you don't genuinely think that's something that's deserving of politicians. We should never have done away with hanging. Are you genuinely serious? You think they should be hanged? I, I don't think we should have given, done away with hanging. But to, to, to say that they should be hanged is, is, is a debatable point and maybe I re regret that. OK. We showed the recordings to Anna Subri. What do you make of that? Actually, I'm heartened because when you spoke to both of them, it was quite obvious that it was the heat. It was the keyboard warrior. And it is being whipped up, in particular by two newspapers. I think the second gentleman was a direct reference that had triggered him from an online article that he'd seen in the Daily Mail. Several Tory MPs have blamed Conservatives supporting newspapers, such as the Daily Mail, for singling out rebels, as well as the Telegraph for calling them Brexit mutineers. The Mail has got a long history now of being deeply offensive. For a Conservative MP to say the Daily Mail has a long history of being deeply offensive... On I mean, Brexit. You, you're not reaching out to your core voters there, What, right? on Brexit? Well, I mean, I'm people so sorry. who read the Mail, I'm so a, sorry. a lot of them vote Conservative. A lot of them do, but there aren't an awful lot of people that buy the Daily Mail. And that doesn't... I'm sorry, but if we're going to be having an honest debate, mm. I'll have an honest debate and I'll call people out when they are wrong. Yeah. And I wish the Prime Minister had done that. What do you think the Prime Minister should have said? And do you think there is concern that it is a Conservative she supporting should, newspaper? Uh, in my opinion, the Prime Minister should have said, I'd defend the right for them to say it, hmm. but they were wrong to say it. Since the murder of MP Joe Cox by a right-wing activist, MPs have understandably been more anxious. If I'd have had this in my inbox, I would be really worried. How do you feel? I do get worried, yeah. I always used to tell my constituents where I was going. So I went to a great carol service in Bramcud yeah. on, on Sunday night and, and I, I haven't told... I didn't tell my constituents that's where I, I was going. Anna Subri says in the case of the abusers we called, she hopes they've now realised their language was unacceptable. Jason Farrell, Sky News. Well, in response to Jason's piece, the Daily Mail said it's preposterous to suggest that the Mail would call for violence of any sort. In a statement, they said no one has been more outspoken than the Daily Mail in condemning the viciousness of social media and in particular the threats and abuse directed at politicians of all parties. Straight to Westminster, where we're joined by the Labour MP, Rupert Hook. Hello to you, Rupert. Thanks for joining us on Sky News this afternoon. Um, what's your experience of um, social online and other social abuse? I mean, look, I've had uh, two particularly Islamophobic uh, sort of tweets. One of them is still being investigated by the police. But, I mean, what I find is certainly it happens more to women than it does to male MPs, and it's people who want to silence opinions that they don't agree with. So, I mean, I've had it for being pro-European. I've had it for speaking on subjects like abortion. I had plastic fetus dolls sent to my office after I spoke out on abortion. Uh, and I've had, um, goodness me, on the Palestine issue as well, I... Uh, generated some heat. I think I was called Talibanistic bitch after that particular uh, speech I did in the House of Commons. And I do think it's not enough to just say sticks and stones. I think that um, the media platforms have to act. What do you want them to do? I mean, I think people like, for example, before I was even elected, so in um, 
2015, 14, this would have been, there was a fake Twitter account of myself uh, called Dr. Hook, and it was spewing out all these bizarre messages. Um, and, you know, that was a kind of impersonation of myself. And uh, I reported it, I pressed the report button, nothing happened until I was elected. And then uh, I think we all had an email, new MPs from Twitter, saying, is there anything we can do for you? And I said, yeah, shut down this bogus account. They did very swiftly. But if you're not in a position, if you're not a member of parliament, they're not going to take you so seriously. And we've seen the logical extension of what happens with uh, these online trolls. I think that these media platforms, Facebook and Twitter, should take... Um, misogynistic, xenophobic, Islamophobic, anti-Semitic, uh, all of these sort of threats more seriously than they do. I get lots of online abuse as well, you know, high profile women particularly do. And I put it down to um, saddos who are, you know, drinking White Strike and the keyboard warriors are waiting for their mum to shout them for their tea. And that's how I dismiss it. Why do you feel that that is not an, an, an easier and a more appropriate way to do that? It's just not acceptable behaviour. I mean, maybe kids in school should be taught more about civic life and respect and tolerance and those kind of things. And, I mean, yeah, most of them are nutty people that in a previous era would have been ranting to themselves in a corner of a pub. But just social media, uh, the World Wide Web, means they can broadcast to a much wider audience. And, yeah, most of them have only got a handful of followers and it just feeds them with the oxygen of publicity to give them attention. But when I had one of someone, you know, threatening to come and get me, I sort of forwarded it to other people and they said, yeah, you do need to tell the police. You don't know. As a person in public life, yeah. you know, the sort of job we do, we're out there every day, um, that you just don't know if it will be a, a nutter. I mean, I know Anna Subri okay. a year ago had yeah. someone who said they would Joe Cox her. I mean, that's appalling. Sadly, and that's, we're out of time, you know, but we appreciate you taking the time to speak to us this afternoon. Uh, good luck. Thanks. We are talking about Jeremy Corbyn, wondering whether or not his prediction of prime ministerial status by um, uh, the end of next year strikes you as either desirable or plausible or both. 0345 6060973. You're right, actually. A text has come in. It's unsigned. It says they are keyboard warriors. Anna Subri is a real warrior. You're right. Uh, she is. A, I've met her once or twice, and she, she is. Um, you'd want her on your side in a, in, a, in a pickle. You'd want her on your side in a fight. 10.56 is the time. Peter is in Archway. Peter, what would you like to say? Back to Corbyn. <laughs> Yeah, good morning, James. Hello, yeah, firstly, and very quickly, I'd like to uh, applaud you for being the only beacon of hope on the airwaves at the moment, <laughs> fighting against inequality that exists oh, well, and this awful you. government. But uh, what I really rang up to point out was that this narrative of, of calling uh, Corbyn hard left and the Labour Party and momentum hard left Marxist, and I'm not saying that you're doing that. I have fallen into it, I think. I have fallen into it. Yeah, I mean, it, it's erroneous. It's not right. I mean, Corbyn is basically left of centre and uh, quite left of centre, but he's not a Marxist by any stretch of the imagination. I mean, by definition, he's a parliamentary uh, socialist. He believes in parliamentary dem democracy. But, I mean, he also believes in, in Keynesian economics, which is, as you know, I'm sure, is based upon state intervention and capitalism. So, by definition, he's not anti-capitalist. So, this whole idea idea that he's going to completely dismantle the capitalist system and, and send all the capitalists to the gulags is, is really, really erroneous and unfortunate because we are facing the most draconian evil government that we've had since, I don't know, uh, the times of Charles Dickens and, and we really need to get rid of them. Do you, do you, want, you, really, you, you clearly really believe that. You see, I, 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 I worry, as you know, about some of the 19th century flavoured things that seem to be returning into into the sort of mainstream, the bloodstream of the nation. I, I think of that report from ITV from Granada last week about rickets turning up in schools and teachers having to have washing machines on, on cycles to wash the uniforms of children whose electricity at home had been cut off and what have you. So I, I do recognise why you say that, but don't laugh at me, especially after your nice kind words at the top of, of your call. I still lean more towards this happening by accident and without them realising than the notion that it's a deliberate policy to, to genuinely impoverish people to a degree where we'll be returning to the days of mill owners and master sweeps. 
Yeah, well, I, I think, I mean, it's just, it is disaster. The cat was out of the bag with Thatcher, and I think neoliberalism has taken it to such a point where it's almost like a feeding frenzy of sharks, and they've just taken it too far, James, and it is going backwards. I mean, it's a retrograde movement towards you know, the workhouse and the, and the deserving and the undeserving poor and all that stuff that, you know, that was featured in Charles Dickens. But, but I, I think because I know some of these people and, and, you know, I went to school with people like that and they're not in my... I mean, but I don't know whether my school's different from Eton. Um, religiously it is. But they're not deliberate. I, they wouldn't... I don't... Well, maybe... Am I sounding naive, Peter, to you? Am I sounding a bit naive? Yeah, James, right. I think you are, mate. Okay. okay. No, fair enough, because these things have happened throughout history, and to suggest that they've always happened by accident, just glance across the Atlantic where you see people actively and passionately voting to be considerably poorer because they have been persuaded somehow that their Mexican gardener or a black fellow over the road is the reason why their wages have gone through the floor and their steel plant has shut down. So, yeah, I mean, that's deliberate. I still can't quite buy it for Blighty, though. I do miss time. Time!